Hello students, today we will again continue with our final series which is looking at a search for a new architecture. This is part 4 of that series and last time we looked at some contemporary trends, we were looking at what is happening in India with changing city skylines, this is a greater concern for past architectural and urban forms, there is a greater impetus towards ecological architecture. Major changes are happening due to digital technology, modernist principles are being revived again, critical regionalism is reappearing again in the 21st century with very strong focus towards a climate responsive or passive design, postmodernist principles are also being explored, architecture as an art form is also one area that architects are looking at and then there is community involvement. Community involvement or com community architecture were attempts earlier made by architects like B. V. Doshi and Charles Correa and this will persist as architects continue to engage in addressing the full range of problems that are facing contemporary India. And architects and planners are at the forefront of this fight for the built environment of the future in India and all over the world. In the 1950s and 60s, the focus was on slum clearance and new housing. In the 70s, we started talking about sites and services program. We looked at Aranya, for example. We looked at incremental housing, for example, in the Belapur housing. In the mid-1980s, slum upgradation was being looked at. In the 1990s, talked about slum redevelopment. But over time, as we have moved into the area of a uh, time period of post-liberalization, the money available or the funds available to develop a socially viable and uh, in infrastructure with regard to the economically weaker sections is slowly not as evident as before in terms of projects coming up for EWS housing. The focus is shifting to uh, more substantial ideas and that ought to be also because uh, this problem is immense. So, when we had seen these projects earlier, we looked at sites and services, we looked at incremental housing, then there was low cost housing in the 1990s, three, three story walk up units in Hyderabad in which there is a three story beam and slab structure provided and individual households could then fill them up and make their own apartment units. So, this is very similar to or a close idea to sites and services and incremental housing. Now, when I talked about this uh, as a, a substantial war footing exercise to deal with the most important problem of the built environment in India today and that is housing. Now, two things are being looked at. When it comes to the cities in totality, we have the smart cities mission that our cities should become smart in every sense of the word in terms of their economics, in terms of the built environment, in terms of resource utilization, etc. And then there is, so we, we are talk, talking of uh, society, we are talking of the quality of life, environment, we are talking of the governance system, we are talking of the economy, economy of these cities and we are talking of the mobility within the city. Then, Focusing on architecture, on, on smart city side, we are looking at planning and then focusing on architecture, we are looking at the uh, schemes like the pra Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana. The Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana is both for the rural and the urban sector. When we talk of the urban sector, it talks about CLLS that is affordable housing scheme under the credit linked subsidy scheme where a major interest subsidy is provided to the economically weaker sections uh, for building their uh, accommodation. Then we have the beneficiary led individual house construction, we have the affordable housing in partnership with private or public sector and we have the in situ slum redevelopment programs. So all this is looked at holistically both at the individual building level or housing level and then we are looking at the overall city level. Then of course, there are various very important documents that are now forming the backbone of the buildings we design today with regard to energy efficiency, resource efficiency, environmental friendly design, those sustainable development goals that particularly refer to environmental design. So, we have the Griha rating system which was which is an Indian derivation of the green rating system and we have the LEED IGBC coming from LEED 
but this is India specific. And then we have the energy conservation building code formed in connect with the Bureau of Energy Efficiency to design energy efficient buildings today. Now, the narrative in Indian architecture is changing. Architecture in India is no longer we look through a western narrative. The variety defies us putting us ourselves or our architecture into a pigeonhole because Indian architecture is moving forward on its own terms. It is a reflection of a very of a, a stronger and a more confident nation. Now, both Gandhi and Nehru had understood one thing that we can neither be tradition nor modernity are not sufficient in themselves. Rather, it is a mix of tradition with modernity that leads to a sustainable development. So, architects right from our first generation that we had seen earlier were searching for this balance between tradition and modernity that has always been an endeavor an objective and also uh, a, a problem to be resolved. How do we connect a long history and a long traditional background with the rising modernism? Young architects are also committed to this search for a meaningful architecture and they are no longer going to be bogged down by stifling categories. The diverse talent is focused on sensibility, the possibility and an exploration of new ideas and identities in modern architecture in India today. Now, the reason why this stif the categories are stifling, they are overpowering is because once we bracket architecture into a particular style or a movement, we become very restrictive in our approach in trying to derive an architecture like that. But we want to break out of that mold and we want to come out of that bracket. We want to develop an architecture or rather the young generation of Indian architects want to develop an architecture that is not predicated to a western ideology per se and that is not also predicated to uh, forcing ourselves to make uh, tr to explore traditional ideas where they do not work. So, they want to have that freedom to come up with an architecture that will truly work, that will be practical and that will be total, truly viable. So, there are examples, lots of young architectural firms are coming up like Samip Padora of SP plus A, this is the Buddhist cent center at Sakarwadi and it is a spiritual and skill, skill development center for the native Dalit Ambedkar Buddhist community and the mandate here was not to harm a single tree. So, this is an ecologically focused design. Then there is the a, a smaller project, the Tara Book Building, um, uh, which is in Chennai by Mode uh, Architects and this is a multifunctional space for a small independent publication house which is known for handcrafted visual books for both children and adults. These are the pictures of that particular building. Then there is the healthcare center at Dharampuri by, by Flying Elephant Studios. These are all young firms which are coming up with very interesting, innovative, forward looking architecture. There is the Sai temple at Venachar by C. As you can see, the very form is a reflection of the temple form of architecture. So, there is a connect between modernity and tradition. The Management Institute in Bhuvaneshwar by Abhin Chaudhary. It is a very interesting building and Abhin Chaudhary is one of the serious upcoming talents in India. This is again the same project and the use of the historical mythological features on the building facade and the use of cement stabilized earth blocks in construction of the management institute. Then there is a kind of sensitivity and sensibility in the young generation of Indian architects like that of Lijo Reni architects in Trishur in Kerala. Now, the region is known for the use of wood for wooden laterite buildings and these this group of architects, this couple, they face this question that why is it that their buildings do not reflect this local identity of the use of wood and laterite? And their answer is the context should not be defined by signs and symbols but issues. Now, there is a very critical issue here. There is a shortage of sand and laterite in Kerala 
and there is a restraint on using wood. So, just to imbibe that regional identity by using such materials which will cause serious ecological problems is not wise. That is the sensitivity and sensibility in their architecture, their buildings are climatically responsive and also evocative, they also evoke the idea of a local architecture, for example, courtyard planning, but it is in a modern context. Their practice is to innovate rather than remain trapped in old ideas of regionalism. So, the building is modern, the building responds to a modern space organization and to modern needs, yet it is responsive to the local climate and also to the kind of spaces needed within which are in connection with a regional identity. So, there is for example, the breathing wall house or the breathing wall residence and then there is the walls and vaults house. Let us take the example of the breathing wall residence in Kerala by uh, Lin, uh, Lino, uh, I am sorry I get the name wrong, it is Lijo Reni Architects and uh, it is a narrow plot in which it has a cotton steel surface as the facade you can see here, which is a perforated sheet in cotton steel allowing for natural ventilation and resistant to harsh tropical climate. How? You see cotton steel has a tendency to have natural rusting as would happen in steel if it was getting impacted by the elements. But in this case, in cotton steel, the rust works to its advantage and creates a fine layer on top of it which protects it. The rust acting against steel ra uh, rather than rust acting against steel works in favor of it and it gives it certain text color, a, a, a patina that is very attractive. And not only that, the central atrium of the house, it is like a courtyard space, it pulls in natural light and ventilation and it is also a landscaped core with a staircase leading to the, uh, to both the east and west wings of the house. The ventilation to other parts of the house is also through this perforated cotton steel wall. Now, these pictures show you, this is looking up, this is looking up the house, uh, we look up to, to from to, with the right staircase on our right side of the picture which connects the two blocks of the house on the east and the west and this picture actually shows you how brightly and naturally lit the house is from inside and this shows a centrally positioned atrium uh, which is running through the center of the house and having lush vegetation. Now, despite the emergence of these creative practices in India, there is still a demand for good design and but this demand for good design is not growing substantially. The, press, now the pressing issues that are facing us, that is, that is one problem, that the demand for good design is not growing substantially. The other is, there is a pressing demand for energy conservation and, and, and energy conservation and climate change, a uh, pressing demand to bring down energy consumption and that is an issue that I have repeated. Uh, so many times in these presentations that I believe this is one of the most critical areas facing the built environment of tomorrow and it, it has to be done on an emergency footing, the work in this area. So, architects cannot now make design decisions based solely on aesthetics and function or convenience and environmentally sensitive design is imperative rather an environmentally sensitive design culture to develop in architects and students of architecture has now become imperative. Let me just take an example of a design which is site, con site conscious and um, uh, an example of an architecture who, uh, an architect who has that environmental consciousness and that is the work of Sirish Berry. In fact, in these last two presentations, we will look at this one project by which we are concluding this presentation today. And in the final presentation, we will look at a future project that is coming up by Sanjay Puri. So, both presentations have got one example to kind of conclude the presentation. Now, Shirish Berry graduated from SEPT and founded Shirish Berry Associates in 1982 in Kolhapur. His work is said to be free and spontaneous and is not bound by the restraints of any particular style. Just as I mentioned a while back, 
but not to be bound by stifling styles and movements. It is intensely site responsive. This is only one project we are looking at, but you can always go and look up his other projects and you will find the same approach towards site sensitivity in his work. There is unity and harmony between the various natural and man-made elements and this project, the Laboratory for Conservation of Endangered Species in Hyderabad, Lacons in 2005 is a classic example of Shirish Berry's work. This is on a 4 acre site with a built up area of 4200 square meters and if you look at the form, it reminds you of something. So, if you are aware, it reminds you for example of a seashell, of a, uh, of, of a snail, for a snail shell, but more than that it reminds us of the Fibonacci spiral. Now, if you want to understand the, 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 the use of the Fibonacci series or the Fibonacci spiral in architecture, please look up the works of Kurbuzir in Chandigarh where the Fibonacci spiral is fitting very well and here it is. The plan is derived from the Fibonacci spiral and this is how the plan has been organized. These are the two, the, the second floor plan, the first floor plan and it is, a, it is a site with huge rocks, but the rocks have not been eliminated, the rocks have been retained and this is where the arrival plaza is. And the, there is an organically designed structural glazing which forms the backdrop and we will talk a little more about it. This is how the glazing is. Now, the glazing does two things, by, by, by circumventing it, by putting it in a curvilinear fashion in this way on the site, we are not letting it destroy the site, we are not letting it destroy the rocks on the site, but we are retaining that. The architect is so confident and bold in his design that he is not concerned that right in front of this elevation there is a big rock in front. He is confident, self-confident I would say that he knows this rock will add to his elevation, not take away from it and he is not so self-conscious that you know his architecture will be overpowered by this natural elements. And so we do find the result, it actually adds to the design. Not only that, the glass itself serves a function of reflecting the natural landscape. So in fact, the glass not only disappears in the background by the way it has been put in but also because it is glass, so it reflects the natural landscape. These are the sections, there are two sections, one is this AA section that you see here and then one is the CC section that is going through and through like this that you see here. And then you have the, the, the design idea to create a facade by avoiding typical visual image of a man-made building. In other words, is what I just mentioned a while back. So let us take a comparison. This was the site what it was originally and this is what happened. What an amazing thing Shirish Berry has done. He has retained it just as it is. He has retained even the contours more or less as they are and the building is formed around them. Rather than building imposing itself on the site, his building merges with the site. Again reminded of right statement, a house should be off the hill and not on the hill. And here we have these beautiful clusters of these rash locks and boulders which have an immense design potential and the architect is fully exploiting them by making them a part of the overall scheme and the, uh, the, the elevation of the facade of the building. So we have the structural glazing, we have the rocks and boulders and the glass curtain wall is bonded to the structural system. There is a reflection of these rocks, sky and landscaping in the glazing so much so so much so that it becomes a non-facade. It simply disappears in the background. It simply uh, becomes one with the surrounding scape of the, the site. So, and there is also comparison of course, we are looking at a building which is completely in an urban setting. This is the Willis Faber Dumas, it was built in the 1970s designed by Norman Foster in, in, in England and here it is Shirish Berry's work and as I can see both have this curvilinear facade, both were uh, built to connect it to the site. In the case of Willis Faber Dumas which is an urban setting, the site was polygonal. The site was like this only 
and Norman Foster did not try to fit the building on an irregular site. He made the site boundaries to have this curvilinear glazing and occupied it completely. And therefore, the site curves were defined by the boundaries of the site. In Shirish Berry's case also, the site topography, the elements on the site define the elevation. There is the use of materials, he is using the stone which is locally found here in the construction of the building and the great advantage is the rocky texture, the texture of the rock and the texture of the stone which is cut and dressed and used in the building is the same. And this is where we see the rocks appearing in the glass elevation. The entire construction of the compound wall, even the roads, etc., is done by using the stones that have been obtained on the site. And this is the view of the inside and the outside. And it is so that inside and outside seem to merge with each other. So, when I am standing on the inside, except for the fact that this is a structural glazing, requires a support to make it stand, basically inside and outside seem to totally relate with each other. These are some of the other views of the building, the interiors and you can see there are other things also with regard to diffuse lighting, the use of the, 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 the natural light in the daytime etc., which is also a part of the overall scheme. So, we come to the end of this first presentation of a search for a new architecture where we again once reminded ourselves once again in some of the areas of focus of modern architecture, we reminded ourselves about community development, we reminded ourselves of the approach of young architects to merge to modernity with tradition and we reminded ourselves that technology is also going to play a key role along with the fact that environmentally conscious design is vitally important for the years to come. I will end here and we will come back to the last and final presentation of this series next time. Thank you.